Mainly this information is in chapter 4 of the textbook we're using at this particular time. If we've changed textbook, textbooks, then it's probably not in chapter 4 anymore if I'm still using the same podcast. But chapter 4 starts out reviewing file types. Uh, mainly we have uh, ASCII files and compiled files, binary files that are programs. Um, then he goes through some file structures talking about uh, mainly variable length records and fixed length records. Uh, we'll start with fixed length records because that'd be the easiest to understand. I think a fix in a fixed length record, everything is the same length. So you have uh, the first field, everything in there has three characters. Uh, the second field, everything has three characters. Figure four one in the book gives an example of that. The third field, everything has four characters, so it's all equally equally spaced out. And maybe not they the all have the same number of characters, but they all have the same number of characters allocated them. So if you look at Figure four one. Uh, field 4 it takes up space from 14 to 25. Now, the word Harrison in that field in the example doesn't take up that entire space, but you know that that space is allocated for it. So that's fixed length records. Uh, more commonly, uh, you would see, I don't want to say more commonly, I'm more used to working with uh, variable length records. The thing about a variable length record is they have a delimiter that um, delimits uh, where one record starts and another record begins. Uh, the perfect example of that is the uh, password file. It is colon delimited. So I just grabbed a few few lines out of there. It's colon delimited. So each field is separated by a colon. Right Here's the first field, the username, the second field, and where the password used to go back in the olden days. The third field is the user ID, group ID, you know, s description, all kinds of other stuff. So that would be a a variable length record each each field is um, separated by a delimiter so in your head the word variable might mean to you that it's actually harder to work with because things change well if there's a fixed delimiter it's always the same delimiter then it's easy to do because most of the tools support some sort of way of telling what the delimiter is I've used cut before in some of the podcasts and stuff so basically I'm gonna say hey I want um, to cut uh, the delimiter is the colon, and I want to get field three. You know, field three from uh, Etsy password. And I only want to look at the uh, first ten lines. Um, I don't need that. What the heck? I don't need that pipe character. I don't know why I had a pipe character in there. So there we go. So, um... Here I got field 3, which field 3 was this uh, UID field. So for whatever reason, if I wanted field 3, I could have uh, could have done that uh, with, a, with a variable length record that has a fixed delimiter. <clears throat> the uh, fixed length records might actually be harder to process because then you have to start keeping track of the number of characters and, and stuff like that. I actually don't have a lot of experience processing through uh, fixed length records. Most of the stuff I've done is, has been using variable length records with a delimiter. So that's actually uh, easier for me to work with because I'm more familiar. So the book talks about that. Then we start talking about standard in, standard out, and standard error. Um, standard input is how your program receives its input. So uh, the keyboard, for example, is standard input into our shell. So when I type, that's how our program gets the input. A, another uh, uh, thing we need to worry about is standard output. That's where the output goes. By default, I use my standard input to, to run a command in my shell. The output goes to the screen. We've already learned a couple of output uh, uh, redirection symbols for, for output. If we do this, right, that's going to create a file and put the output in that file. So here I did ls and called it ls file, right? So now if I look at that file, my ls file, my files went into the ls file. That This will create a file with the output. If we use the double greater than, that's going to append to the file. So now I'm going to do a long listing uh, with the ls and put that at the end of my ls file. So now if I look at my ls file again, now I have, if you look up at the top, I have the original listing and then I have my long listing. So that's output redirection. You can also redirect input with the greater than command. Oh, that's less than actually. The less than symbol. So uh, normally we can do cat uh, file 
what it was my file called, ls file. And now we'll display the file, which we just had. So if we do that again so we can see it. I believe we should also be able to do cat and then the redirect symbol and then ls file. This should work. I don't use input redirection a lot. I use pipes much more. So yeah, so if you if you use this command, that will say, hey, run the cat command and send this file to the standard input. So it's going to cause it to pretty much show that file. It's a different way you can do the same thing we just did. Like I said, I don't use that one a whole lot. I normally use the, the pipe symbol if I want to get uh, some file or something through the uh, standard input. We'll talk about a pipe. I'm not sure when we'll talk about a pipe. I don't think it's in this chapter. So, yeah. So we'll talk about a pipe at some point. Um, uh, the other output redirection is uh, standard error. If you try to do something you can't do, like right now I'm not logging as root, so if I try to change the owner of one of my file names, <coughs> if I try to change the owner, that output you, you see there is my standard error output. That was an error. It got, it got delivered to my standard output because that is where standard error goes by default to the same place as your standard output. Just like we can redirect our, our command output with the greater than or the two greater thans, greater than, two greater thans, for writing to a file or appending, we can also tell our standard error to go to a different file or something else like this. We can say, hey, I only send the errors to my error file. So now in theory, I should get a error file and nothing on the screen. So there I ran the same command that generated the error. I redirected the the uh, I redirected the output to a file. So now if I look at that file, I have the error in that file. So uh, you may uh, use that if you're doing some scripting or something and you want the errors to get saved in a file instead of printed to the screen especially if you're going to be running the script automatically from cron or something, so that way the script's going to run at midnight. Nobody's going to be sitting looking at a screen, so you're not going to see the errors. So if you use this, it'll save those errors in a file. So another thing you can do... See, the book has it now. Another, another special uh, error, another special redirection symbol is you can do something like... You can redirect the output to error file to no, that's not called error file. Output file. Put ugh, put file. And you can say, hey, I want my all my errors to go to the same file. So uh, doing this, <clears throat> there are numbers associated with the file descriptors. Two, this this two, I guess I should go back a step. This two says File descriptor 2, I want to go, file descriptor 2, I want to put on this file. So file descriptor 2 is a file descriptor for standard error. File descriptor 1 is a file descriptor for standard out. And I'm pretty sure 0 is standard in. So in this case, I'm saying, hey, run this command, uh, send the outputs to output file, which in this case, there's going to be no actual output. Send the errors to the same place the output's going. So if I run this command, I got the output file had the output, which there is no output, and it also had the errors. So there I got my errors. So let me think, let me try to think of a better example. So yeah, so I have some files that are readable by root. So if I if I do a let's see what I could do. If I try to cat a file all right, let's see. These files are readable by root. This file is readable by, I don't want to do that. Error file is readable by me. So if I do cat error file and also cat change pw.sh, one of them will display output and one of them will display errors, right? I can't read the change password file, so that's going to give me errors. So what's going to happen here is we're going to see my error file and then we're going to see an error, hopefully. Yeah, let's not use error file. Let's use what I want to use. Uh, ls file. Let's use ls file. Because that way one of them will be actual output. 
and not an error. So there, there I have the output from my ls file, and then I have my error. So if I want to send the output to, you know, out file, right? That's going to write the output of the command to the out file. The errors are still going to go to the standard output. So there, my error still went to standard output. If I look at out file, out file, it has the output of the ls command. So if I wanted my errors to go to the same place, I could do two ampersand one. That's going to send everything to that file. So now we have the output and we have the error. And I think I could send my errors to a different file like this. Let's see if that works. So now out file. Out file has the output and error file has the errors. <clears throat> yeah, so that was the let's go back to the top. So to summarize, this case we are uh, catting these files, displaying the contents. This first file I have permission to read, so the contents of that file will end up in the out file. The second file I do not have permission to read, so that generates an error, and those errors go to error file because of this output redirector that says send the errors to the error file. So that takes care of that. So let's maybe try try combining some of those. So let's try this. Instead of catting the file directly, let's use the input standard in input direct indirect the standard input redirection symbol to send the file into the standard input. So this should still fail because I still can't read that file. Uh, what's going to happen in out file? Jeopardy music? No, no, no. Well, nothing should happen in out file because I'm only going to get an error because I can't read that file. What's going to happen in air file? No, 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 no. Yeah, I should get an error in air file, so let's see what happens. Oh, I got an error to the standard output. Hmm. So let's look at. Let's do that again. I wanted to remove error file just in case because it was already there, so I don't know if we rewrote it or not. Yeah, so um, that's not the right file. So the error file is gone. So what happened? Well, in this case, I actually tried to read this file before I ran the command because I used the input redirection. So since I could not read that file, it could not be sent into the command, so that's why the error was not generated by the cat command. This is actually way more complex than I wanted it to be. The error was not generated by the cat command, right? This output redirection was aimed at the cat command. So it said, hey, cat, any uh, errors you get, put in this file. Well, this error I created was an error based on the shell. So this was a shell error, which is why it was... It was uh, written here. So let's go back to the way we did it before to see what happens. The way we did it before, <clears throat> I called the cat command and I said, hey cat, I want you to read this file. Right? So cat reads that, cat tries to read that file. Uh, once cat reads that file, it's going to try to redirect the output into the output file and if there are any errors, it'll put in the error file. So then in this case, let's remove the output file for fun. In this case, in this case, it's going to, the shell is going to execute the cat command. It's going to try to read this file. If it reads that file, it's going to put the output here. If it encounters any errors, it's going to put the errors here. So in this case, it's not going to work. We're going to have nothing in the output file. We're going to have something in the error file, just like we did before. So more out file, nothing, more error file, something. The other one where we had we could actually read the file. Get rid of our error file and out file. The other one where we could actually read the file where we're using our our ls file. So this one's going to send the output to the out file and the errors to the error file. In this case, we could read the file. We should have output and out file. 
Yes. We should have no errors in error file because no errors should have happened. Yeah, so <clears throat> that was a little more complex than I anticipated when I started. But just to review, this uh, will cause the uh, file to be sent to standard input. This will cause the standard output to be written to a file. It will overwrite the file if uh, one exists. This will cause standard output to be written to a file. It will uh, append to the file if the file exists. And this will cause standard error to be written to a file. Uh, I guess it will override. I never tried this. I don't know if that will append to the file. We could try that. Let's try that. There's no error. Yeah, let's try this. So if we do this, there should be two lines in error file if it appends. Nope, didn't pin. I don't think. Let's try again. Oh, I deleted the error file. Yeah, so that will cause it to append to the error file two greater thans. Two will cause it to append to the file. And this will tell it, hey, yo, put the errors in the exact same place where you're putting the output. So those are our, our output redirection. Uh, commands. The uh, next thing the book goes in through is to manipulating fi manipulating files, create, delete files, remove directories, copy files. We've talked about a lot of this stuff already. Um, the two main ways the book tells us to uh, create files, we can do this, uh, redirect nothing into a file, file one, that'll create a file, right? We can touch a file, that'll create a file. So we do ls, oh, I wanted file two. If we do ls, now we have file 1 and file 2. If we use some of our stuff we learned in them before. We want to look at everything that starts with file. We can do that. You know, we want to look at our file followed by one character. We can do a dot. Dot didn't that work? Oh, question mark. Question mark. We can, get, we can do that. That's some stuff we, we learned already. Um, the touch command can also do some other things. You can use the touch command to update access times. So if we look at the ls-l, it has times associated with the with the uh, update and access. This is the update time. You can use touch to update those. Uh, I don't necessarily know that there's really a good reason you guys would be doing that unless you're trying to be devious or something. So I'm not going to show you how to do that. Uh, the remove command we already went through uh, before. Basically, you remove files. Uh, you cannot remove directories that are not empty. Uh, use, oh, sorry. I'm going to load it myself. Remove files. You can remove dash rf to remove a directory that's not not empty uh, because you cannot remove deer a directory that has anything in it so we've already talked about that uh, let's see what else uh, <clears throat> copy I'm going to talk a little bit more about copy because we uh, we had someone who said that they would like to hear some more about copy so we're going to talk a little more about copy so uh, in the simplest case Copy a file, right? I had a file called file one. I want to have a file called file three. I'll copy the file using the names. Copy file one to file three. And that's going to create a copy of file one in file three, right? So that's the simplest case. Another thing you can do, you can combine copy with some of our relative path uh, directives. Let's make a directory called files for fun files for fun. So now if I want to copy, I'm going to put something in file one. So now if I want to copy file one into the files for fun directory, I can do that. It will copy into that directory. Well, that won't because that doesn't say copy. It will copy into that directory. Uh, one thing you may not know is you don't have to go to the end of the command line. Like right now, my, my Cursor is in the center of the command. You don't have to go all, all the way to the end of the run. You can just hit enter. It'll run it. So now if I do a ls files for fun, I should have a file one, right? So this copied a file to the directory and kept the same name. Well, what if I want to call that something different? Um, like say I want to copy file one to files for fun and I want to name it file one for fun. Well, you can also specify a name to copy the file to a different name. So now if I do a ls of files for fun, 
Uh, what's going on here? Uh, I'm having temporary uh, connectivity issues. Oh, there we go. LS files for fun. Now you see I have file one and file one for fun because I copied it with a different name. So if you copy a file, you can specify the second argument as the uh, file name you want to copy it to. The second argument can be a directory you want to copy it to and keep the name the same. Or the second argument can be a directory and a new name you want it to be to. You can also combine some of the other things we learned uh, about specifically the dot and the dot dot. So say I want to go into my files for fun directory and I want to use the pwd command to verify that just because I want to make sure where I'm at. Say I want to copy a file to my next level up directory. So I could copy file one for fun to dot dot, right? Remember dot dot means a parent directory. So I'm going to say, hey, put file one for fun in the parent directory. So after I run this command, I'll have a copy in this EC2 user uh, directory. So let's go back up to that. Hey, now on a CD backup to where I was at. And I have a file one for fun. <clears throat> so that was copy. Um, some uh, arguments it gives us with copy. Uh, copy dash I provides a warning before it overwrites. Uh, our system has been aliased. I wonder if we can see that. No, I don't see the aliases. Anyway, our, our commands have been aliased, so when you run copy, it automatically runs copy dash I for you. Um, copy dash S will create a symbolic link. We haven't talked about those yet, but we will in the future. So just keep that in mind. Copy dash U prevents copy from copying over an existing file if the existing file is newer than the source file. So that'll help you not overwrite files accidentally. Um, another thing we could do, we could combine the uh, star and the question mark to copy file. So remember we did, uh, we did some copying. If we do copy file question mark to um, files for fun. That's going to copy any anything that has file with a with one character. So let me, let me remove those files. So uh, so now I have nothing in there. So if I run that copy command, now I'll look at what's in there. I should have files that just have one character after. There, I have the uh, one, two, three. Now, if I do a copy file star, that's going to copy everything that has a one, two, three, except the directory, because it does that for us. So there, I got all the files that started with file. Um, yeah, move is similar to copy, except that it doesn't copy the file, it moves the file. So that's kind of like rename. So if I want to make file to cd uh, files files for fun if I want to make file to be file to for fun now file two is file two for fun we do the same I like fun so let's make file three file three for fun three for fun and uh, I don't like file one anymore because it's not very much fun so let's get rid of file one so now I just have fun files which is awesome because fun's the best. So that's the move command. There is a find command that can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, we're not going to go into stuff. We're going to look at the most common option uh, you will probably want to use if you're looking for a fi file with a particular name. So let's uh, let's create some more files in here. File. No, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Let's create one more. Touch file, no fun. no fun. There we have a file called no fun. So if say you know your data is in a file called something for fun, actually let's take take a step back. Say you know the name of the file you're looking for, file one for fun, you can use the find command to find it. So the find command starts with find, it takes an argument, the first argument is where you want it to look. So in this case, I'm going to say, hey, I want you to look in the current directory. And what I want you to look for, I want you to look for, well, if you don't specify anything, 
it's going to find everything, which can sometimes be useful. Say, say uh, for some reason I you know deleted the ls command. You're like, oh, I don't need you. I can do find to figure out what files I have, right? Not very useful. But what we would want to possibly do is look for a file based on the name. If you know the name, you can say uh, dash name uh, file file three for fun fun and now it's going to find that file for you well hey we could have just done an ls to find that well let's say you didn't know where the file was you knew it was in somewhere slash home right but you didn't know exactly where it was at uh, and the internet internet must be going down right now ec2 dash user so there it found the file and it told you exactly where to find it so another example say let's do a more real example say you want to find the resolve.com file somebody told you that that file is awesome and you want to find it so you can see what's so awesome about it you have no idea where it is so you can say hey find start at the root directory and I want to find the find na file name resolve.com so let's use something else we just learned. Get rid of the errors because I don't want to see errors. And now we'll just see the output when it finally finds the file. The thing about find is it has to scan the entire disk. So if you know where you're looking, it makes sense to narrow it down. Right? If I knew it was or suspected it was an Etsy, I could say, oh look in Etsy. And that happened a lot faster. Did you see how much faster that was? This takes a while, like a second. And this one's a lot faster, like instantaneously. So in this case, our file system is not that large, so it's not that big of a deal. But just keep that in mind. Um, another thing you can do with find, you can find based on all kinds of stuff, files that have been changed in certain times. You can look for files of a certain size. And you can do other stuff. One of the things I like about find is you can run a command. I'm gonna probably check the man page for this. You can run a command to uh, on the output. I gotta figure out the syntax. It's a pretty long man page, huh? Yeah, so let's see. So let's try this. Say I want to do a I want a long listing of the files I find. I can do something like this. Dash exec ls. And I can't remember the syntax for this. This essentially says missing argument. Let me go back to the man page. Yeah, so execute command all the following arguments. The string is replaced by a current file being processed. Both of these constructions might need escape and I quoted to protect. Did I put a command? I don't know. This doesn't work, I'm going to give up. Alright, I give up. Uh, I don't want to waste more time on that extra thing right now. I'll find the answer for, I'll figure out the syntax for that and show you guys later. Uh, but I don't want to spend too much time digging through it right now because it's not one of the uh, one of the options it gave us in the thing. Uh, next thing the chapter goes through is combining files. We've already used cat <coughs> to combine files. So let me r remove errors. Let me put some stuff in file two. File two for fun. File two. 
file two. Then you put some stuff in file three for fun. File three. So we've used cat to combine files. We can do cat file one for fun, file two for fun, file three for fun, and redirect that into fun files. And now we'll combine the files head to tail. What does that mean by head, head to tail? In order, right? The next thing our book talks about is a paste command. I've never actually used a paste command, so I'm not quite sure when it might be useful. But anyway, apparently with a paste command, instead of combining the files head to tail, you can combine them side by side. So if I do this, paste out. If I do this, I don't need to redirect it, I'll just print it to the screen. How about that? If I do this, it puts the commands beside each other. Let's see if I can do three files. So yeah, so there may, I, I can see how that would be useful, maybe. I've probably done some scripts to do the same thing unnecessarily. I can see how that could be useful. So that might be something you might use in, in at some point. It doesn't seem to be very complex. I don't see... Uh, any options? Yeah, it says you can. That's weird. Two things. Uh, the book says it says you can use a dash s to paste the files one after the other inside beside instead of beside each other. So that makes it work just like cat. That's kind of cool. Uh, it also says you can use a dash d to change the delimiter. So if you want to have like a colon delimited file. You can have a colon delimited file. So yeah, I can see how paste might be useful. I haven't used it before, but probably because I didn't know about it. <coughs> cut command. I've used it before. It allows you to cut uh, out of a file based on parameters, based on the field numbers in the delimiter. I just uh, did some of that earlier, so I'm not going to do that again. Well, I guess I'll do one more example. Let's uh, do this and redirect that into a uh, paste file paste file. So now, so far, my most of my examples would cut. I did one field, so let's get a dash d colon um, paste file. Oh, no. Sorry. Dash f1 paste file. So that's going to give me field 1, right? We'll say I wanted field 1 and field 3. You could do 1, comma, 3. So you can get three fields if you want. And it's uh, delimited with a, with a uh, colon. So that's cool. Um, you can do you can use a dash C with cut instead of say instead of getting field oops C instead of wanting field one you can use a dash C and that'll get the characters. So if I want the characters one through three, you know if I had a fixed length record, I could do that and that didn't work. Oh, so I uh, don't need a delimiter when I am cutting based on character number. So that said, give me give me field one through three. Oh, sorry, field one and three, not one through three. That's weird. I wonder if I can do one dash three. Yeah, so I could do one dash three to get one through three. Change it to five. Or one comma. I changed it to five so we get some more characters. One comma to get the actual characters, which I'm not sure how useful that would be. Um, next command, sort. If we want to sort a file, uh, we can do that. Uh, sorting the file will put it in alphabetical order, essentially. So let's create a uh, file file for sorting um, beans so our grocery list potatoes um, steak uh, yogurt milk um, bread uh, orange juice, um, apples, uh, 
some coffee. Got to have coffee. I'll probably buy more coffee than anything else. Uh, that's good for a grocery list. So now we have a grocery list. We can sort that alphabetically. Um, file for sorting. We can sort that using the sort command. So uh, sort is useful. Uh, I use sort a lot when I'm trying to get rid of duplicate things. So say for example, um, file for sorting. Say for example, I have some of these in here more than once. Like I let the, the six year old make the grocery list. He's like, ooh, I like milk, we need some milk. And uh, I want more potatoes, which will never happen because he didn't even like potatoes. And let's get lots and lots of coffee. Mm, let's get lots and lots of coffee. So uh, lots of times when you're doing scripting, you want to get a list of items, but you want to only want one of them each time you see it. So if you have a file like we just had, it's all out of order, you can use sort to get the file in to order. All right? Hey, look, my file is now in order. <clears throat> and then you can get rid of them using a command that we probably shouldn't talk about yet, but I'm going to anyway. Then you pipe it into unique, and it'll get, it will get rid of duplicates that are side by side. So in that case, I got rid of the duplicate entry. So now I have a unique list. Let's, uh, for fun, let's let's unique that file without sorting it and see what happens. Just to demonstrate the difference. Without sorting it, when you unique it, it doesn't work. So unique only works if the files are right next to each other. So that's why you have to sort it before you can unique it. I use that all the time when I'm scripting, all the time. Um, yeah, the next thing the book talks about is creating script files. We'll be doing that a lot late in the in the uh, near future, probably. But a couple things I want to talk about right now: uh, a script file is basically a file with commands in it, right? So a couple things that are interesting to me about this. I'll put some commands in here. If I do this, this will work. Well, eventually this will work. So let's talk about that. The way you run a one way you can run a script is by executing it, putting dot slash in the script name. So this is going to say, "Hey, I want you to execute that script." It's not going to work because I don't have permission to execute the script. Another way you could execute the script is you could say, hey, I want to run the shell, and I want as the input to that shell command, I want it to be my script. So that actually worked because I didn't execute the script. I executed the shell command and told it to read the script. So that actually worked. So, you know, if you start scripting, this is going to happen almost every time you write a script because you forget. So the way to fix that is mod uh, u plus x script one give the user execute so now you can run it right another way I just showed you that if for some reason you can't remember the other part you can just do this and that will say run the shell use this script file as the input for the scale shell so that's the way you can get around that another thing about the uh, shell scripting lots of times if you are seeing a script you will see the uh, line at the top that looks something like this. This, I think, is called, I've always referred to it as the invocation line. I don't know if that's really what it's called or not, but that's what I've always called it. Um, this line basically says, hey, I want you to run this in the shell, the, the born shell, not the born again shell. So if you don't have this line, it's going to run in whatever shell you're running. Does that matter? It can. If you're using a shell such as the C shell that's kind of different, and your script is written using some of the special born shell things that, that don't uh, exist in the C shell, then your script's not going to run properly. Another time you'll see this is if you wrote a Perl, Perl script. It will say, you know, wherever Perl lives. It'll say user bin Perl or whatever. So uh, now if I run my script again, it still should run and do the same thing. Uh, that didn't really matter in this case. It will matter if you get a different shell, perhaps. <coughs> See. I think that's all I want to say about scripting for now. Uh, we'll do a lot more scripting later on. Uh, join command uh, lets us uh, put two files together. 
to link the files together based on a common field. So uh, let's see what we have here. For example, we have uh, some names and stuff. Yeah. So let's go ahead and create two files. Bi join one. Uh, so let's put some names: John, two, Dave, three, Rich, one. Clearly. Uh, who else we have? Uh, uh, Joel, four. <clears throat> so that's our file one. We have file two. <clears throat> Join two. We have, let's see, Pete's. What the heck just happened? I didn't want that. Pizza, one, beer. Two um, tacos, three fish, four. So there, I have two files. All right, join one, join two. Look at those two files. I have two files. They have a common field I can use to join them. The the number, right? So say I want to get a file that says what each person's name is and what it is they like more than anything in the world. I can use this second field to join those things and let's look at the uh, syntax of that join there we go join join dash one two dash two what the heck dash one two dash two two uh, join one, join two. Let's see if this works before I tell you what it did. That's not what I wanted to do. Let's see. Okay. You must sort the files before you can join them. Oh, well, that's not good. You must sort the files before you can join them. Each output line contains a common field from file one, then a line from file two. All right, so let's try this again. Let's uh, one. Let's sort the files. Um, they based on yeah, let's sort the files. Based on field two, eh. whatever. Like paste, I've never used join. I'm not gonna waste a lot of time going through that right now. I'll look up an example. I'll I'll, I'll figure out a good example, and I will uh, put that in place in the next podcast if I remember. I'll go ahead and circle that on my sheet so I can remember. I need to uh, talk about that again once I figure out the syntax. God, there goes my R of invincibility. I'm so disturbed. Awk is the next thing we want to talk about. <clears throat> I use awk a lot. Uh, I like awk. Awk is like Cut's big brother. Awk can do everything Cut can do, but it can do it a lot better and a lot more stuff. Uh, mainly with awk, I like to pull out uh, certain fields uh, of data and print things and stu stuff like that. So, uh, for example, let's look at the password file. So say for example I wanted to get just the the username and their login shell. So the username is the first field and the login name in the in the login shell is the last field. So in this case I can do something along the lines of awk awk dash f colon I need to specify that's a capital F colon. I need to specify the delimiter is a colon. All right. I want to um, what do I want to do? I want to print something. Yeah. I want to print dollar one dollar one two three four five six seven dollar seven. So let's see how this works. I'm pretty sure this isn't gonna do what I want it to do. 
but we're going to build to what we want because this is how it works in the real world and you don't know what you're doing. So I'm going to say, hey, I want to do this. I want to print $1, $1.7. Hey, look, it printed it, but it didn't print it in a useful, useful format. So I'm going to redo the command. I'm going to redo the command and I'm going to change it differently. Instead of catting, instead of reading the file, I'm going to head dash 10 the file because I only want the top 10 lines. Pipe that into op. There, I did the same thing except I only got the top 10 lines because that's all I really wanted. Um, I could have done the same thing with this other command. I could have piped the output into head dash 10, right? So that I got the same result. But what's the difference? If I do it this way, it processes every line but only displays the top 10. If I do it this way, which way? Yeah, this way will process every line in the file but only display the top 10. This way will get the 10 lines of the file and pipe that into the command. So then it will only process the top 10 lines. So does it matter for this one? Not really, but if, you're pro if you have a file that has millions of records in it, and you only want to do 10, you probably only want to send 10 into the file, into the command, instead of processing it all and just displaying the last 10. So let's go modify our file a little bit. Uh, we want to put some space between the, the uh, output. So there, I'll put a space in there. All I did was put a space inside the print, print character. You can put some other characters in there. You can put, you gotta put what you, the regular text in quotes. The user, User, the user, whatever, and we'll put some stuff in here. Has the login shell of. Alright, so now it's going to print some actual stuff out. Oh, not in VI, happens all the time. And it didn't like my uh, syntax. It still doesn't like my syntax, probably doesn't like the colon. It still doesn't like my syntax. Let's get rid of this. There we go. So there it did that. I don't know why I was having problems printing the other thing. Let's go try to put that back in. Oh, I know why. Stupid. I need the print to be the first thing. Because that's a command. Print. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Figured it out. Alright, so that's that's what all can be used for. You can also use printf, which uh, if you're a programmer or have been a programmer, printf is like formatted printing where you can make it print in certain ways. You can do all kinds of other stuff in awk, but that's mostly what I use it for. So um, I believe that concludes this uh, podcast with Chapter 4, commands from Chapter 4. I will look into join and put something out about that once I figure out the syntax and how it works. Um, don't forget, I want to know some intro music and then also include whether or not you think my intro music should also be exit music. If I need like different exit music or the intro music and the exit music could be the same, or, or what you guys think? Because I really need—I uh, really need to be the coolest podcaster in the entire world. So uh, that's that.